Hello there, once again, this is Corey Smith with the Petersburg Church of Christ, and this is chapter 22 of the book, Muscle and a Shovel. Have you ever been fed up? Fed up to the point that you were ready to give up? I was fed up with the churches and so-called Christians in general. Jonetta and I had attended a different church every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening for many weeks in our search for the truth, and we were nearing our breaking point. It was the last week of February, and we had agreed to take a break from church. The funny thing, everyone claimed to follow the Bible. Everyone claimed to be a Christian, yet the concept of unity was a complete joke. There was no unity in the world of Christendom. Tolerance was substituted for unity and it did not require an advanced intellect to understand the difference between the two. One definition of unity is the state or fact of being united or combined into one as the parts of a whole, unification. The definition of tolerance, however, is a fair, objective, and permissive attitude toward those whose opinions, practices, etc. that differ from one's own. With these two definitions in mind, consider what Jesus desired in John, John 17, verse 21, when he prayed that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, that they all may be one, one mind and one heart. This is a singleness of thinking, of believing, and of practicing spiritual things. New Testament Christians did this very thing. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, the text says that they, quote, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Paul told the Philippian Christians to be, quote, like-minded to having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Peter said, finally, be ye all of one mind, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. The principle of Christians being of the same mind, like-minded, having a singleness of heart and mind, and all Christians being of one accord, is taught throughout the New Testament. Real unity is a group of people who believe, think, and practice the same things under the banner of Christ using the Bible as their only guide. <clears throat> but today's denominations or divisions dotted the landscape, each teaching an opposing set of practices and beliefs. Their idea of unity is to keep their individual beliefs, practices, and doctrines while accepting all other differing, even conflicting beliefs, practices, and doctrines. That's not unity. That's tolerance. Tolerance is not Christ's teaching of unity. Tolerance requires compromise of one's beliefs. Why does the world look upon the name of Christ with such disdain? Because the world sees so-called Christians splintered into hundreds of man-made divisions, while at the same time claiming to follow the one book, one faith, and one Lord. It makes no sense to the world. It made no sense to me. <clears throat> Many non-religious people make this accurate observation. You cannot follow one book, one faith, one Lord, and at the same time maintain thousands of opposing practices. Denominations oppose one another in belief, in practice, in name, and in deed. So-called Christians smile and glad had one another with great pretense of love and friendship. However, as soon as those with different denominational affiliations leave one another's presence, they mock the other's respective denomination. It made me sick to my stomach. I had had my fill of the interdenominational, fall for everything, stand for nothing, community church crowd. Interdenominationalist or community churches claimed a non-denominational stance, but in reality, they accept everything except true Bible unity. Toleration is the substitute. If the community church crowd thought their message was Bible unity, they needed psychiatric help. It was early Monday morning. The coffee pots at the Shell station were out of order. No problem. OSI had vending machines in the break room. It was early enough that there would still be plenty of time to get the coffee, break a bill for change, and get a few cups from the machine. Randall, I got his attention. He was standing in front of the coffee unit buying his own cup of OSI's machine. 
I wonder if he shopped at the same shell, shell station too. Hey, Mr. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Randall. How about you? Man, if I was doing any better, I'd be on prescription medication. We laugh together. Randall, I've got a spiritual dilemma that I'd like to share with you. I began to explain, and Randall was, as Ross Perot was, all ears. I outlined our spiritual situation and the things we'd been through during the previous weeks with the community churches. Mr. Mike, how about you and I do this? Randall suggested as we finally sat down at the break table. It's time for you and me to talk about the gospel and the church of the Lord. Did you know that his church still exists today? No, Randall, I didn't. My friend, he continued, as I told you before, you can't be saved outside of his church. But Randall, I interrupted, that's just too narrow-minded for me. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it, Mr. Mike. Where is that found again? Matthew seven fourteen. But Randall, that can't be right, I argued. Why, I asked Randall. Because Jesus is the vine, and the denominations are the branches. I was trying to refute his premise that there was only one church. Randall started to chuckle. <laughs> Mr. Mike, who told you that? He was surprised. I bet it was one of those high-paid denominational preachers, wasn't it? Well, uh, I tried to remember back to the conversation it came from. I think it was a Lutheran minister that I figured as much I'm interrupted again. Mike, the word does not say that Jesus is the vine and that the denominations are the branches. In the 15th chapter of the book of John, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. And he said in verses 5 through 10, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We were sitting in the company break room without a Bible in hand, and Randall quoted the text verbatim from memory. His mind was amazing. Mr. Mike, Jesus said, ye, or you, are the branches. He was speaking to his disciples. Men are the branches, not denominations. This is proven in verse 6, where Jesus said, quote, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. I was going to confirm what he said with my own Bible, but I already knew that he was speaking the truth. Yes, I had been misinformed again. Misinformed by a nice Lutheran minister who misquoted John chapter 15, verse 5. How many people had the Lutheran minister misinformed and misled over his years as their pastor? Stay right there, Mr. Mike. And Randall took off out the door. I knew he was going to get his Bible. I bought a cup of coffee and considered going back to see the Lutheran Reverend. Randall came back in with his Bible, put it on the break table, and pointed to a passage. Mr. Mike, read this with me. He pointed to 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, and we read, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And were you baptized in the name of Paul? Mr. Mike, look at what was happening there within the church of the Lord in the city of Corinth. Christians were beginning to divide up and following after men rather than staying unified in the teaching of Christ. Is this where denomination started? Well, it was the seed of denominationalism. Men have always had a tendency to follow after other men rather than to stay with God's instructions. 
those at Corinth were all ready to try to divide themselves up. Look here at verse 12. Randall pointed at verse 12 and said, some of these like the teachings of Paul. So they started saying that they were of Paul. Others liked Apollos. So they started following after Apollos. Some like Cephas, so they followed Cephas. He continued, Man, this is just like the Catholics following after the Pope and calling him God on earth, or the Lutherans following Martin Luther, or the Mennonites following Menno Simmons. I was listening with rapt attention. It was interesting stuff. And look at how Paul straightened them out. He asked them a few questions, simple questions here in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Randall went on. Now, Mr. Mike, remember that Paul was an apostle. He was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He saw those New Testament Christians going down the path of apostasy. What is that? I interrupted. Apostasy means to fall away. Those Christians at Corinth began to falling away from God's will. They had to be corrected before it was too late. I listened. Paul told them back in verse 10 what God wanted for them. God, Paul beseeched, wanted them to all speak the same thing, to teach the same doctrine of Christ, and that there be no divisions or denominations among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, same beliefs, practices, teachings, and behavior. Randall's logic was consistent, solid, relevant, and in harmony with the remote text of the New Testament. But Randall, I said to him as I continued to look for obstacles, I'm a musician. He looked up from his Bible. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, you don't use instruments in your church, and I love music. It was weak, but I could not think of anything else. I was running out of excuses. Mr. Mike, I tell you what. Give me five mornings of Bible study, one hour each morning, just five mornings. Then you decide for yourself. After five mornings, you'll have enough information to decide, and it'll be your decision, not mine. After that, I'll never mention it again. Fair enough? We'll continue to be friends either way, I asked. Absolutely, Randall. Randall smiled and stuck out his hand to shake it, shake on it. You've got a deal, I said as I shook his hand, sealing the deal. Mr. Mike, would you like to start next Monday morning, February the 29th? What time? How about 6.45 here in the office? Why not? But you're getting the donuts. Krispy Kreme's from a man, Randall shouted as he strolled back to shipping and receiving. That guy was a treat to be around. As we walked to our respective offices, I realized that Randall had again shown me several passages that I had never seen before, and I had never heard them preach from any pulpit. How could I have gone this long without knowing these things? There was a good answer to this question, and it was coming sooner than I realized. There you have it, folks. That is chapter 22 of Muscle and a Shovel. Again, my name is Corey Smith with the Petersburg Church of Christ. And I invite you to study what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. When the question was asked on the day of Pentecost by the Jews there in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they said, what must we do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked that same question in Acts chapter 16. What must I do to be saved? What must you do to be saved? You have to hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to believe it. Mark 16, 16, Jesus Christ himself said, if you believe, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who believeth not will be condemned. You must repent of your sins. Paul said in Acts 17, verse 30, these times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess your belief in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, and confess with your mouth. Jesus said, if you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. You must be baptized in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. When those on the day of Pentecost asked, what must we do, men and brethren? And Peter answered, and he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus Christ said, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then finally, you must live faithfully. You cannot turn back to the world. Revelation 2.10, Jesus says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Again, I hope that this has been beneficial to you. Hope to have chapter 23 up very soon for you to follow along in this study. I know some of you have been following this from the beginning. We appreciate you being here. And if you, anytime, if you have any questions, if you're watching this on our website, you can click below and leave a question for us. We will respond to you as soon as we possibly can. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, we invite you to leave comments as well. As always, find us on Facebook, Petersburg Church of Christ, and here on our website, www dot scattering the seed dot com until we speak again god bless you if we can help you in any way feel free 